Hello everyone, welcome to another show, Getting Naked with Happiness. I am your host, Stephen Liu, and Getting Naked with Happiness is about bringing well-being to the next level. And this is where I interview happiness leaders, well-being experts, and resilience champions. And today, we have a very special guest, and she is none other than Jade Xia, a local celebrity. Of course, everyone will know her. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so, welcome Jade, welcome to the show. Thanks. And as you know that this podcast is all about mental health, promoting positive well-being, and I would like to start off by asking you the first question. Okay. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> Seems like a race. <laughs> okay. Is there a certain favorite memory that you have, if you think about it right now? What will pop out to your mind? So many. I mean, I had a very happy childhood in general. Like, it was very... Um, it was very simple. I mean, money was always something to be concerned about. Like, if I needed to buy new things or if there's a school trip, it will always... I think from a young age, we, we kind of just knew that our family didn't have a lot of money and that these things were luxuries. But there were so many happy memories too. Like, my family loved the beach. So, like, every week, I guess these were the things that we could do that didn't cost a lot of money. So, my parents really tried to give us a sort of happiness. So, they used to bring us to the beach every Sunday. They would cook something. Oh, okay, my mom doesn't cook, but my granny would cook something, or my dad would cook something. And then we would just go, they would bring a ball. Sometimes they would bring a frisbee. Sometimes they would bring nothing. We'd just run around like kids. We just, you know, with my cousins and stuff, we would just spend. I just remember, like, almost every weekend spent by the beach. I guess to this day, that's why, like, East Coast has a lot of happy memories, at least for me. So I think there's not one specific beach memory that I like, but I just remember like spending practically every Sunday, and it would be like, the, not just my family, but my extended family, and my aunts and my cousins, and, and we would just, yeah, we would just, just have really simple fun, I guess, yeah. And, and those were like some of the best memories, I would say. So I mean, so now like when I think about it, like, you know, there are all these orchestrated ways to, engage your kids or to let your kids have fun like they are like expensive indoor playgrounds sophisticated toys like my nieces have some really sophisticated toys but it's just i just feel like actually you don't need that much to engage kids you just need because with less right you gotta use more of your imagination yeah you know there's really like it's a piece of chalk you gotta figure out what how you can make how to make this fun yeah you know whereas if you have like a sophisticated toy that you just play with it or you don't really have to think Mm-hmm. So I like, but I like those run around like a crazy person game and like, <laughs> like crazy person game. Yeah, there were so many fun ways to play. We had so many permutations of how to play catching also. Yeah. Like we had two people catching or we had like ice and fire catching or something. I don't know. I remember we had a lot of ways to make it more fun mm. or more challenging. And I think like when you have so little, then you're just forced to make it fun. Or. Yeah, I like the part whereby you share these positive emotions and experiences from the past, right? And this is your favorite memory. And the reason why I ask that is because this is also known as a technique called positive reminiscence. Oh, this is a positive? Yeah, yeah. So when we you know, want to encourage mental health, well-being development, so we always ask the question that if you could recall a favourite memory from the past, what would that be? And most of the times people will say that you know, this is related to their family, yeah. their childhood, and by doing so, immediately we get transported back to redraw all the positive emotions and we get to relive it right now. Oh, I didn't know that. So you're trying to say like if a person is feeling down, this is something that they could do? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is one of the methods, okay. uh, of course. And on that, not just because of this, but I was also very curious to ask, can you please share with us who would be your favourite mm, person in your life or who would be your superhero? Wow, my superhero. Uh, so many. Also, I'm like, I think I, I feel like I'm pretty blessed. Um, I would say my mom because she, you know, now like I have a lot of friends who have kids. I mean, I don't have kids, but I have friends who have kids and even they laugh and they say, how do our parents do it? They have like one kid and they have a helper and they have their mom and their mom-in-law and they're already finding it hard to cope. But like, I think my mom and my granny had, they just made it work. I don't know. My mom worked a lot. Because, you know, like I said, we had, um, it was important that everyone contributed to the family income. But somehow she still found time to, like, read to us every night or, like, yeah, put us to bed every night. And she was a nurse. So she worked shift work. So now thinking about it, actually, I don't know how she did it. I mean, there was sometimes we would sleep later. She'd tell us to go to sleep, but we wouldn't. Mm. Usually we would still wait for her. 
uh, and we'll get a bit upset when she has to work night shift but otherwise she will always make the effort to do it and for my grandmother she just took care of all of us and she still managed to find time to cook and clean the house and to still find time to play with us I just feel like I'm not sure how they did it I'm not sure I could do it and like my friends who are mums really admit they're like I don't know how our mums used to do it I think a lot of them had mums and grandmothers like that too and and it's just pretty amazing you know then like people just got on with it and they just did it so it would be your mom and your grandmother yeah. who are would be your superhero yeah. and role model. And could you maybe perhaps name some of the qualities that strikes you as a superhero abilities or strength? Uh I would say definitely for my granny, especially resilience. Okay. Cause when in her time like they were like really, really poor, like struggling, like I think she planned to have two kids. And then two kids, like she, I think she decided, okay, that because my grandpa didn't earn very much money, so two kids we could handle. Then two kids became three kids. Then three kids became four kids. <laughs> very Catholic, huh? Yeah. Then four kids, the last one was, was a pair of twins. Okay. Oh, twins. So, okay. so she told me she actually cried. She was so worried how to feed five. Mm. She was already thinking four would be a stretch, but then the last one suddenly, you know, last time I, um, what's that? Ultrasound is not so advanced. So she had no idea she was carrying twins, you know, mm. until she gave birth. And like, oh, congratulations, it's a girl. And then she's like, oh, okay, great. Then, oh, wait, there's one more. She said at that moment, she kind of like panicked. So I was in resilience because it was not an easy life. Like after that, to make ends meet, she went out to, to be a cleaner uh, for her own siblings. And I said, why do you do that? She said, because I never wanted them to turn around and, and say to my children one day, do you know, like we, our, our parents gave you a like, charity handout. So she said she earned it. But I mean... There is, you know, you have to, there's a sort of lowering of pride to go and clean someone's house, your sibling's house. Really, she went to be a cleaner for both her siblings. And it wasn't like they were mean, they insisted that they would help her, but she insisted that she wouldn't take money unless she cleaned their houses. So, you know, she just made ends meet like that. And she settled a lot of like family debt and all that just by herself. And she told herself that she would put all five kids through school, which she did, which I think is pretty amazing like considering she is not educated herself because I guess also because she's not educated she felt like this is something that she wanted all of her kids to have mm. for my mom I would say it's kindness even though I scold her about it because I think she's overly you kind sc- scold her, yeah scold I just scolded her. her a few days ago I said you cannot be <laughs> so kind to everyone because people take advantage of my mom but she's just like that. Like if, if, if anyone asks her for help, even if she, she doesn't know you, right? Like if I say, I have a friend, Stefan, and he needs some help with something, right? Mm. She will help. Is it because that maybe like nurses or people in the healthcare industry, they are, they are much more empathetic and compassionate? Yeah, but I guess then it's, it's, it's cause and effect, right? Is it mm. that they are much more, they are people, because my mom said her dream, when she went to the hospital for the first time and she saw the nurses, but she wanted to be a nurse. I'm like, who says that? <laughs> She's like, so nice, but you get to help people and you get to work in the hospital. So I think it's like cause and effect, like you have that sort of personality and that's why you want to be in that line. If you mm. ever sat down in a hospital, because my mom went for some neurosurgery a few years back and then so we spent a lot of time in the hospital just looking after her for once. And then my dad and I, we watched the nurses and we're like, how did she do this for so many years? It's really such a difficult job. You know, they're on their feet the whole day and then mm. there's so many things to remember and then you're walking in and out and then there are a lot of annoying patients and even more <laughs> annoying patients' families, yes. you know, who ask a lot of questions and it just takes a lot of patience and a lot of care to be that sort of person. So I think, yeah, it's part, partly the job but it's also she chose the job, you mm. know, and then she's just very kind. I think like, I haven't seen her say no to anybody at the expense of her own. So I scolded her like, because it's at the expense of herself. Like, because she would take care of everyone else first before herself. And I think like, I said, mom, sometimes you have to think about yourself. Then she said, well, you're very fierce. I'm like, yeah, because you don't think about yourself, so I have to think for you, right? Interesting when you say that, because um, I just had a conversation with a friend and her mom is also a nurse and yeah. she's also very compassionate. And like this, right? And this. Yeah. And, and there's a note about people who are givers. Yeah. They, and uh, something about people who are givers and people who are takers and people who are givers, apparently that they are the highest performers and the lowest performers in society oh, okay. based on the research. Okay. And in between, we have all the takers. Oh, really? Yeah, so it simply, su- it simply suggests that if we give and we are compassionate, we are getting more in return. But we have to give in a strategic way, of course. Yeah. 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 
And if you give everything, maybe it's not so good. Yeah. But it seems that your mom uh, is so compassionate and kind, and it's a strength. I mean, it is a strength. I just feel like, I guess it's a side of me that's very protective of her, but then it's definitely one of her strengths that I think is, um, I haven't seen in a lot of people. Do you think that kinder people are more resilient, given that your mom is kind and your grandmother is also very kind? She went out to clean and, I mean, dedicate her life to raise her children. And, you know, you say that she's not so educated. Yeah. Do you think there's a certain correlation? Well, I don't know, actually. I mean, on... My first thought, I guess, I would think that there isn't because the natural way to think is that if you're overly kind, then you get stepped on, right? But maybe there is something there. I, I see it as separate strengths. I don't really see it as correlated, but um, maybe in the kindness, you build some resilience. The other thing is I realise both my mom and my grand, because of the stuff that they've gone through, they are both very, very resilient. They are kind, you're right, but they're also very, very resilient. There you go, kindness equals the so more resilient. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. At least in these two examples, I would say, yeah, maybe. Yeah, well, I think that maybe it's, there's a indi- it's very indicative because kindness somehow is one of our positive emotions. Mm-hmm. So we have like joy, we have yeah. interest and all that, right? And we, when we get to tap on all these emotions, we are also expanding our emotional library okay. in all areas. So we get to experience more of life. Yeah. So if we also get to fee- uh, assess the, all these emotions, it could be negative or positive. But it seems that when we assess all of them, we are much more fuller and become whole, a bigger whole of ourselves. Okay. Yeah. And because you also talk about your grandmother yeah. and your mom and how they are your superheroes, I would like to ask an, uh, the next question about, is there a certain episode or setback in your life that you went through? Um, I think it was two years ago when my grandmother passed away. I took it very hard, but I also, it just, kind of hit me that life is so short, you know, and like, I mean, I grieved and a lot of friends said like, I wish I was that close to my grandmother as you were to her. And it kind of hit me, I was like, what do you mean? They're like, oh, because I think like, we, we went through a lot of photos and like, people came to the wake, we made like, a photo, mon- my cousins and I made a photo montage. And so people, when they would sit there, they would just see the photos, right? They're like, wow, you guys did so much together. We found a lot of beach photos like because you know we were at the beach all the time. But we also found a lot of other like photos like just simple trips that we went to. I think my family, like we did one or two bigger trips when when you know finances were more stable, uh, when we were older and my parents were a lot more like yeah more settled in their careers and had savings and stuff. We could go on longer trips, and we had we had photos of that. But also had a lot of photos of just very random stuff like my grandmother liked to eat pizza, so I always to bring her to eat pizza at Pizza Hut buffet. And was there a Pizza Hut buffet? There was a Pizza Hut buffet and she could eat quite a lot of pizza, okay? <laughs> like, for an old lady. And in fact, she told me that her biggest regret in life, she's like, I feel so sorry for... She told me, I feel so sorry for my mother and my grandmother and my great-grandmother because when they were alive, there was no pizza. Mm. Like, she actually loved pizza so much. But I just, I just felt like, you know, when someone said it to me, I was like, actually, it's true. Like, we had all this time, but... It's also because a lot of the time that I spend with her, sometimes I will feel guilty because I take time away from work to spend with her. I was like, I'm so glad I did that, you know, because I didn't have regrets. And I, I think it was then, like, that's why I went crazy. I think, like, the year that she passed away, someone asked me if I, if I like, won the lottery. They're like, your friend struck lottery, is it? She's like, suddenly, like, I just, I just took off and I just traveled wherever I wanted to that year. And I was just like, I save all this money. Actually, I really don't spend much money because there's nothing much that I really buy. I really don't buy very much. And I was like, actually, the only thing that I like to spend money on is travel, so I should just do that, right? So when your grandma passed away, was that the most, or one of the most painful experiences that you have experienced in life? Yeah. And, and after that, you went away, you changed your lifestyle, you changed your perspective. Actually, I, never, I have never sat down to think about it this coherently until now. Okay. It's definitely the most painful experience in my life. I think the change wasn't so drastic. Maybe that's why I didn't tie the two together, but it was definitely a change. Because I realised everyone is going to die. And I've never been afraid of death, but it made me more aware of that I don't want to regret. So for better or for worse, I became Mm. very YOLO. Like really very, very YOLO. I think that trip I went, you only live once, okay? Just yeah, yeah, you only live once. So yeah. it's like I really, really lived and breathed the YOLO. Mm. 
that year I went to like so many places. I went snowboarding I think four times, you know. Because mm. like, you know, screw it, I just like this sport, I'm just gonna go. Yeah. So I went like once, twice in a month. No, my friend was like, hey, you see how didn't you just come back from like a snowboard trip? I'm like, yeah. You know, mm. so I went twice, like four times. I went to like climb Machu Picchu, I went to like hike to Everest Base Camp. I just did a lot of things that I wanted to do that have been part of like on my bucket list for the longest time and then in my head I'm like because I'm so reminded of my own mortality I was like what if I die tomorrow I will never fulfill this bucket list I have no time I need to do this now mm. so I went to do all these things right? and I just told myself like I can make a lot of money later or I can make money when I, when I need to make money but I'm going to spend more time with people now mm. so they're travelling for two years after the passing of your grandma I mean, not all of it was positive, right? I mean, part of it was like, there was the traveling, then I also went a bit crazy with the like, the lifestyle. Okay. I don't generally like sleeping. So I just told myself, I have no time, I have no time. Sleeping is such a waste of time. So I was like, okay, I, sh- I should not spend any time sleeping. Mm. So, you know, I would just like, sleep very little. I would meet a group of friends number one, two, three, mm. four, five, in the night. And I'll go home, sleep two hours, and I'll meet like my mom meet some other people mm. <laughs> like just squeeze as much into my life as possible mm. it's just like I have no time I have no more time it was a bit extreme la. it mm. was a bit extreme so I think like it's interesting talking about this with you now because I've never thought about it that way but I think that her passing made such an impact like to remind me of this mortality that I've I felt like I need to do all these things you know and that like life is not going to be here forever mm. so when you were going through that period I don't know how to phrase it better, but during her passing, yeah. what were some of the, uh, the immediate thoughts or feelings that occurred to you at that point of time when she passed on? I mean, we were kind of prepared. I mean, nothing really prepares you, but she was sick for many years before that, which I think like while we didn't want to see her suffer, it helped us because when she passed on, you know, like, my mum and I took it the worst, I, I dare say, like, because she stayed with my mum and, and, I mean, I stayed with her for many, many years. We shared a room for many years, actually. Because <laughs> when I, I saw one flat and I went back to live with my parents for a while, like, she had taken over my own room. So I was in my 20s and living in the same room as her. I think, like, it was just... We were happy for her to be reunited with my grandpa. Because she was very... She missed him for many years after he passed. Um, and we were relieved that she was relieved of the pain but of course the loss is still quite great mm. thanks for sharing that I think yeah you know, I mean <laughs> I didn't really want to talk that much about my grandmother I think because it's still quite I wouldn't say it's fresh but it's still painful mm. I think a lot about this um, show is about sharing emotions that matters I think on many different levels people are also grieving t- because of loss of someone or they could be, su- not say suffering, but they're going through some sort of personal crisis, dealing with the psychological emotions. Yeah. So by sharing it today, you're actually very brave. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I was really like, I mean, it's not like, because also because I said I didn't need the script and I didn't need the questions, maybe I should have asked, <laughs> that I should have vetoed on top about my grandmother. <laughs> Yeah, but by saying so, you're also expressing a lot of uh, raw emotions that help us to process our own emotions because we have been confronted by our emotions that we have not faced yeah. or dealt with for a long period of time. I mean, I, I hope it helps other people going through the grieving process. I think it's... I didn't realise that I was still grieving. Mm. When do you realise you're, you're still grieving? I think when my husband said, you're going to kill yourself. As I'm going to kill myself with my lifestyle. He said, you are not sleeping. Oh, at oh. all. At all. I mean, like, I was sleeping like one, two hours a day. Wow. He's like, this is not, you know, healthy. So he, I think he said that, and then like... Um, wait, wait, you, you didn't sleep, you slept only for one hour, one hour, two I hours mean, a I mean, I would like, meet friends, meet friends, meet friends, go party, okay. go party number two, go supper, come back at like 6am, okay. sleep two hours, meet my mum, okay. then go out, go out, go out, go out, and then repeat. Okay. And, then, and then there's a weekend, and then work day would be, you know... So it was just it was just quite intense, I think. Then Were you running away from the hurt? I think so. I think okay. so. So I mean it helped to after that, um I he highly encouraged it. My mom highly encouraged me to see someone. Mm-hmm. So I went to see a therapist and it did help. I didn't realise how much I was grieving until I started seeing her. Mm. So I would say to anyone who is kind of struggling, like, please try to find help in some way. I didn't feel comfortable talking about this with my friends. 
Because I feel like if I talk about it, I'm going to cry. And it's not like I'm ashamed to cry now, but like who wants to be with a crying person all the time? And it's been like, a, I mean, now it's been like two years, you know, and... But I did talk to friends who have lost someone close and they say you never really get over it. You just move forward, you don't really move on. Mm. You know, so I guess that's that's kind of it. And I'd say like if you can if you have the resources to seek help, please please like just try and talk to someone, at least for a while after you're grieving. And I'm curious to know that when you started seeing a therapist, what was it like for you if you could share? Like for those people who are maybe thinking to see a therapist or they are being told to see a therapist but they're still facing a lot of resistance because they think that they don't need help. So what was the turning mm. point for you to transform, to transcend that? That's a good point. I mean, I think I've always thought that there is a slight... I think for me, less so the stigma, but there was a little bit of that, right? Like, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm not crazy, mm. right? But. And like, I also didn't want to admit that I was depressed. I don't know, I don't think, to this day, I don't think I was depressed, depressed, but I think I was borderline. Like I may have gone there, right? So, um, I think it helped when I met a friend. And okay. I, I do think things happen for a reason. So I met a friend, and it's not even a close friend. Mm. And I met him and he, I don't know, we started talking about random stuff and he told me that he went through a bad breakup and that he actually went to see a therapist I was kind of shocked because it's a dude, firstly. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, it's a guy. And we're not that close. And for him to say it so... He said it in such a blasé way, like, uh, like very casual, like, I went to the tailor, that kind of thing, you know? Like, I also looked at him, I was like, how come you're so cool talking about it? He said, because... It's fine, what? I said, and... You mean you tell people openly that you see therapists? I mean, I also know people, like, generally open up to me mm. more than they do to the average person. So I thought it was just me. Then he's like... He said not to everyone, but I'm not ashamed to say that I, I've been. And then I told him, like, I didn't tell him like whatever I was going through because I didn't feel that comfortable. But I just said, um, I'm going through some things. Like, you know, I've been thinking of... Because up to that point, my husband and my mom already said, you should see someone. He said, yeah, you should. And he gave me the contact of his therapist and, and that's the therapist that I went to. Right? So it, it kind of, that was the catalyst. I would like to say it was a great... Um, it was a great moment of like self-realization that oh I should see a therapist but it wasn't mm. so I do feel like if you are listening to this podcast or if you are watching this video that maybe that's the sign for you right that you should go see a therapist because I just needed like that little push so I'm pushing whoever is watching or listening right now please go and see someone if if you just feel like you need a bit of help because it is money well spent if you have a bit of cash to spend and uh, my husband said this therapy is like massage it's like, you go for massage, what? Because I'm a sports person, right? Mm. So you go for sports massage to relax your muscles. You go for therapy to relax your mind. Oh, I like that yeah. analogy. <laughs> yeah, so that was the analogy he gave me. He said, like, there is nothing wrong with you if you go and see someone. So I would like to encourage like, I said, people who are thinking about it. Because if you, you're actually thinking about it, it means you have something that you may want to talk about. Right? Then please see someone. Mm. And I really like, I'm a very open person. If you're not as open, it might be even harder for you to talk to friends, mm. right? So then you really, even more, you should see someone, mm. right? Like a trusted professional where you won't be judged or you wouldn't feel like you're being judged. Do you tell your friends that you were seeing a therapist? Close friends. Okay, how did you? Yeah, I told a few close friends. Uh, interesting, I mean, one or two had quite typical reactions, like very concerned, like, are you okay, Jade? Like, you know, because they see it as like, it must be really bad that you're seeing a therapist. <laughs> Another two friends were very sweet. Separately, they said, "Ah, yeah, just pay us lah." Because <laughs> <laughs> they're like, "We can like save your money. We are here for you. Mm. You know, you can call us anytime." And I really, I thought that was really sweet, and I appreciated it. Um, but I did say, and I can't text you guys all the time. They're like, "No, no, 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 no. It's okay. It's not texting at all. Like, you know, we are here for you." So I appreciated that. But I also said, "No, like, let me try. Maybe sometimes a professional is helpful too." Yeah, I was strongly, strongly encouraged for those who are listening in or watching this to see a therapist. You just take it as like seeing a, having a personal coach, yeah. right? If you do sports or you play golf or you do running, just imagine that you have a personal coach and someone to guide you along, nudge you along and highlight to you what are the things that you can focus. Especially talking about mental health, we have to you know, talk yeah. to somebody. And sometimes when we talk to our friends, 
they may not be they are not trained, but they love you. But they may not necessarily be the best person to be non-biased because they yeah. still may have some sort of like background biasness that they don't, that may impact a decision or impact a certain advice they, or they offer to you, right? And on that, would, Jade, would you like to perhaps advise or share an advice to people who are going through griefing? What not to share to a what not to say to a person who is griefing? Um, okay, it's interesting because for me, I know like like for me, I didn't really have any triggers, but some of my loved ones at my grandmother's wake and funeral, they were very angry or touchy about certain things. Like personally, I didn't because I feel like. Honestly, I'm a very awkward person in, in certain situations. Like, I know people, like, if I tell you that, then you're like, no lah, you know, you're very, like, sociable. I am sociable, but there are certain situations that make me feel very awkward. And funerals and wakes are one of them, even before my grandmother passed on. Um, when I would go to a friend's, like, a close person's um, funeral or wake, most times the wake, I would very awkwardly go and then I don't know what to do. Like, mm. if I went to, like, a close, someone close to you passed away, I'd be like, uh... I'm sorry for your loss, Stefan. And then I would give you a hug awkwardly. But then if you're not a hugger, then I don't know what to do because I'm quite a hugger. Then, okay, if you don't hug, then I don't really know what to do. Maybe I awkwardly pat your shoulder. Mm. I don't really know what to say. Right? Mm. I really don't know what to say. And and then like you go through the... Depending on the religion of the deceased, right? you go through the ritual, which I'm, I'm okay to do. So if they're drastics, I will hold the drastics. If they, they ask me to say a prayer, I'll say a prayer. I'm okay with all of that. But beyond that, I really don't know what to do. So I think I asked my mother this. Because my mom is like the kindest person I know, right? And yeah. she's like very good with these kind of situations. I said, Mom, I feel so awkward. Sometimes I ask her to go with me. Like, can you go with me for this friend's wake? Because I really am so awkward. And she's like, you know, Jay, just being there is good enough. And just letting the person know that you are there for them and you made the effort is good enough. I said, really? That's good enough? I achieve her, right? So I mm. feel like I need to do more. But she said, that's good enough. And she said, if you sincerely went because you really wanted to go, and not because you felt like you needed to go. You said, it's good enough. People can feel that. I was like, really? So, I, I, like, since then, I've gone with my awkward self to mm. funerals and wakes and just been my usual awkward self, mm. right? And I hope people feel... I mean, I went to a friend's father's wake and uh, I went, like, way after everyone else had left because I couldn't make the time that a lot of other friends were going. And we're not super close also. But then I just... I felt like he was... He was... I don't know, quite chatty and he opened up to me and I stayed quite long and chatted with him and he texted me after that to say thank you so much for being there. And I felt, I was very touched because I, I felt like actually I didn't do anything. I was literally just there talking to him, right? But then I think maybe that's all you need to do. So for people who go for wakes, okay, so back to my story. So some of my, I, I, I don't really want to say this because I don't want to make people feel like even more awkward than like, so some of the people, like my relatives got annoyed when they said things like, uh, don't be sad oh. or like I know how you feel honestly I didn't get triggered because to me don't be sad is they just don't want me to be sad I mean it's not the best advice from a, from a psych, psychology point of view right but the layman who's not into psychology wouldn't know this right so I, I think don't be sad to me if someone said don't be sad and people have said to me don't be sad at my grandmother's wake and I took it as nothing but kindness. Like, they just don't want me to be sad because I'm their friend. Mm. Some other things that triggered people were like, I know how you feel. So I know some relatives of mine were very annoyed. They're like, how do they know how we feel? Mm. This is not their mother, grandmother, auntie, grand aunt, you know, because my granny was close to all of us, right? But to me, it's like, these people are just awkward. Lah. They're like, as awkward as me. And they don't know what else to say. But by saying, I know how I feel, they're just telling you that they're connected to you and they feel the same way you feel. right? So I think... My advice, right, is not so much for people who are going to awake what you should not say. It's for people who are receiving the condolences what you should not take as bad. Mm -hmm. You know, like, don't take, don't be sad as a bad thing, you know. And don't say, I know how you feel. Of course they don't know. Nobody knows how it feels to lose, like, your mother. Like, even if I say that to my mother, like, the loss of my granny was really bad. But of course it was worse for her. It was her mother, right? And my grandmother stayed with her later on when she moved back out when after my grandpa passed away she moved back in with my mom so my mom was like stayed with her and she was the key primary caretaker who would know how my mom feels not me i wouldn't know right but if i said that i don't think she would have gotten pissed 
And I'm just saying to people who are receiving the condolence, don't get pissed. Mm. People say dumb things because people are dumb. I'm dumb too. People mm. are awkward. They say awkward things, mm. right? But then you have to look beyond the like awkward, weird stuff that people say and understand that they made the time to go down for the wait. Mm. And they're telling you not to be sad because they just don't want you to be sad. Or they don't know what to say, right? They just don't know what to say, yeah. right? So I think people should just be less sensitive, you know, and... and like look beyond the like, yeah, okay, that's maybe a dumb thing to say, but actually the person just didn't know what to say. Yeah, well, like, this is awkward situation, they don't know what it's to say. Awkward. I mean, it's I'm difficult. really awkward, so like, you know, if I've been to anyone's, I don't know, friends' wakes or whatever, and I've been very awkward, I'm sorry if I mm. said the wrong thing too, but I just know that for a person to make the time to be there, hey, going for a wake, uh, it's not exactly a fun thing to do. It's not exactly like going to a club or a party, right? It takes time to... If you don't drive, it's worse, right? They public transport. But even if you drive, you go to a, like an obscure place most of the time, and then you sit around people you don't know. You make small talk. You know, not everyone is good at that. Then you you try to not look awkward. You know, mm. that's an effort. Mm. So I feel like if you if your friend has made the effort, just appreciate the effort, even if they say something that you think is dumb. You know what I do when I go to a funeral? Yeah. I know that sometimes we have to we have this awkward situation. Yeah. You don't know what to say, but being there is very important. And of course, the natural thing to say sorry for our loss. Yeah. Uh, what I do differently would be I uh, will print out. I know it's a bit different. I uh, print out the st- uh, five stages of grief. Okay. And I will print out on a piece of paper and I will pass it to the person. That is so helpful. Yeah. Thank you for saying Th- that. That's so helpful, actually. Yeah. Based on the five stages, they will know that what psychological stage they might yeah. be going through, yeah. whether they're in denial, in anger, or they're in blame, so that at least they can refer to it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not going there to lecture them. Say, is, this, is this stage you're in right but now? But you see, somebody <laughs> could have taken that badly too. So that I'm just, I'm just saying, like, I think like communication is two-way, right? So the receiver has to receive it with love as well, like, because it was given from a good place. Mm. I feel, I, uh, the other thing, like, I feel like, I'm not going to say what you shouldn't do, but I'm going to say what you should do if you want to show your friend who is grieving more concern, follow up. Because yeah. actually the days and weeks after the funeral are the worst. So just checking in. Like I have friends who would check in, you know, on me, like, how are you doing? Or they, I know there are friends who would like deliberately try to get me to come out more and stuff like that. Like, that's really important. And even if you don't want to like go out or whatever, just checking in and say, how are you doing after everything and all that. It's, it, it, that's something that you could do for your friend, I would say, yeah. Okay. I would like to ask you one question, which is quite spontaneous. Okay. Is there anything that I should ask you regarding overcoming personal pain and suffering? Is there anything that I should have asked you but I have not asked? Mm, overcoming? No, because I think like mine was a very learning journey. You know, I, I think that like over time, you know, since I wish I had studied positive psychology earlier, but some of the resilience tools that I learned that I feel like are really helpful. And I think one of the things that I was told, which I thought was very useful, is you should repair your ship in a dry dock, right? So I think that's very, very useful because I'm very reactive generally. You know, so when something happens, I'll fix it. Something happens, I'll fix it. But then you don't want to like something happen in the middle of the sea and then you fix the ship, right? So I think that what I wish I had done more for myself, you know, prior to my grandmother passing away. And actually, even the three years prior to her passing were very difficult because we were all, I think, mentally grieving already because she became a totally different person. Mm. You know, she kind of lost her mind slowly because she had dementia and Alzheimer's and it was difficult. I think that you can do things for yourself, not just to deal with the loss of, like, in terms of death, but even, like, a bad breakup. Like, there are resilience things and tools that you can do that help you. Can you share a bit more with those who are listening and watching this, a bit more about your perspective of positive psychology, what you have learned about resilience? I think for me, resilience, um, meditation, interestingly, I think any of my friends who watch this probably like laughing. Because I used to like make fun of them, like, well, this mumbo jumbo, ask me to sit there. Someone sit still, no, but first I mean sit still. Like sit still for like a few minutes. Huh? People do this for like half an hour, you see? Huh? So like to me, this meditation thing is a bit crazy, but there have been so much science about it that it's hard for me to ignore. And I'm a quite a facts-driven person as well in certain ways. It's very hard to ignore the science that talks about like things like neuroplasticity and how your brain, you know, strengthens certain connections. And because I'm a sports person, right, and they liken it to like training for something, right? So I mean I work out, but I see my body change over the years. It's not it's not an it's not um 
an instant thing. Mm. I have friends who say, wow, you're very toned. I'm like, yeah, but it wasn't like, in- like, what's your secret? I said, there's really no secret. I just work out regularly. Right, and then like, how come you have so much energy? What's your secret? I said, I don't know. I'm just... <laughs> I just, I've just always been active, you know. Yeah, what's the secret for energy? <laughs> <laughs> this I have to ask I actually think that's my superpower, okay? <laughs> I tell people power. that. Yeah, where do you only... draw energy from? From the sun or...? <laughs> <gasps> from other people. So I'm sucking your energy right now. I mean, the truth is I really do draw energy from okay. people, but I think a lot of it is, is an active lifestyle. Mm. And um, so I feel like I believe in that physically for my body and I've seen not the aesthetics, but I've seen how much my performance has increased because I played netball since I was seven. Mm. And it's been like, oh my gosh, it's been like almost 30 years now. Mm. Right? And, and <laughs> I, I've seen myself like even, you know, when you're like in secondary school, you're supposed to be your fittest, but then you take it for granted. You don't bother with conditioning. But then now at this age, I play with girls who are half my age. You kind of have to keep yourself in, in that sort of conditioned state, right? And I realized like it's just regular training that keeps me like that. Mm. And the science is that meditation does that for your mind. The mindfulness meditation, right? I think it's not just mindfulness meditation. I do a, a variety because I, you know, I get bored doing any one thing. Okay. So I do a few variations of meditation and it's nothing very difficult, you know? Like it's not like I'm some guru that can sit there and lead that stuff. But I mean, there are apps, you know? And then if you're a cheap, cheap old and you don't want to pay for an app like me, then you just do it online. Like there's like YouTube videos, just mm. skip the ad. You just listen five seconds of the ad, then you skip it. And then there's so many kinds. So I only do like two minutes in the morning. Okay. I try to do two minutes in the morning every day and I do it before I sleep. Actually, it just helps me sleep. Lah. So I don't really consider the night one doing it because I'm lying down and it helps me to sleep. Mm. But I try like, I, like last night I tried to do loving kindness and I got to like the second stage. And, <laughs> right? So I like, I mean, it, but I feel like it still helps in some ways, you know, and it's just like working out. A little bit is better than nothing. Something is better than nothing. Mm. So I think I always thought you must do it for like at least 15 minutes. Then if you go and like Google one minute meditation also have. Mm. So just do one minute lah. Mm. You know, so my one minute became two minutes, became three minutes. I haven't moved up to anything more than five minutes, okay? Okay. And I'm okay with that. Okay. I'm okay with that because I feel like I'm already a lot calmer and better. Comparing to? Comparing to just me before pre-meditation. Okay. I would say. So I think like the few things, meditation, mm. journaling, which is again because time is like, you know, not much time. Mm. I set an alarm. Three okay. minutes. I write for three minutes. Set alarm. Now. Okay, done. So I tell myself, two minutes of meditation, three minutes of journaling, only five minutes a day. Will it kill you? Like a five minute morning habit is okay, right? Okay, just let, let's slow down a little bit for those who are <laughs> listening and watching this. Could you okay. share? Because my next question is relevant to this. Oh, okay. It would be like, can you share one daily habit that contributes to your well-being? Wake up early. Okay. Wake up early. Like that is my number one thing. Actually, I released a video on this. I think I like the five habits for a happier life. And there are five habits for me that have led to a happier life. But the number one thing is for to wake me up is to wake up early. Okay. I mean, I I know there's a lot of studies on like, there are different people who are different. I don't know how true they are. Okay, I, I'm very a skeptic about a lot of things. Which, as, which is good, yeah. As a natural morning person, it's very hard for me to believe that, huh, people are better at night, really? Right, I don't know. There might be nocturnal creatures, but for me, waking up early, it makes such a difference because I feel like my day is so long mm-hmm. and I feel so energetic waking up early. How early do you wake up anyway? I like to wake up like, I don't like waking up anytime. Like after 8, I feel like it's late already. Okay. So I, I preferably like 6.30 is good. Okay. And then, you know, so I would say wake up early and go and do a workout straight away. Straight away? Straight away. Okay. Like wake up early to work out. That's what I'm saying. So if you got to work, get to work at like 8, then wake up at 5.30 and do it. If you got to get work at 10, then wake up at 7.30 and do it. I mean, you know, just adjust. Okay. These are like, I mean, so if I pick one tip, it's, but I think it comes together. So like, wake up early and then go work out. Okay. What new habits, ideas, or beliefs that you have gained for the span of the last three years that has helped you improve your life or well-being? Uh, okay, definitely meditation. But like okay. I said, I say that like, with the caveat that my meditation is two minutes a day. <laughs> So it doesn't have to be crazy, just set aside, like I would say even one minute a day if you don't have time. Um, the second is journaling, like I said, I do two minutes or three minutes a day. But if you don't even have time for that, then I, I've done, like I do the three good things. So I just write down three things. To share be share with us a bit more about the three good things, as I mentioned, if you could. So this is something I learned in positive psychology that sounds so silly, and I actually wrote a research paper on it, because I really, I wrote a research paper on it because I really believe it. Okay. And it sounds... 
I even wrote an article for her whole magazine because I, on this because I believe so much in it. It sounds so silly, but it's literally writing down three good things that happen to you in the day. Like, I think you're recommended to do it at night. But because I'm a morning person, I do it in the morning because at night. I just don't have energy to do these kind of things at night, you know. I just want to sleep. And I, like, I just want to, yeah, just not deal with these kind of things at night. But so in the morning, then I think about three good things that happened the day before. And then you write them down. And I think before I used to write great things that I was grateful for, but it was always quite repetitive. Mm. You know, like my husband, my best friend, my mom, mostly people, lah, you know. But then I realized that actually the point of this, right? So I feel for this to really work properly, is that it has to be really specific. Mm. So I've been forcing my husband to do it with me at night. He's very bad at it. I was like, I said, why is it so hard for you to think of three good things? He's like, because the whole day was good. Mm. I, was like, I was like, why was the whole day good? It's like, because nothing went wrong. I'm like, <laughs> that is not like that is missing the point. But okay, so my point is, it could be something really small and lame. Mm. Like for example, just now I went, I finished a bit early, so I actually had time to eat lunch. So I went to Lucky Plaza to eat Yong Tau Fu, and the queue was long, but I moved very fast, mm. and the food was very yummy, and we got a seat. You know, it's like really, really like small things, mm. or like um. Today I passed by Famous Amos and it smelled so good that I decided to buy a whole bunch of no-nut cookies and I ate them. Okay. And I'm just thankful to be able to eat them because, you know, like, if you think about it, right, if, if for some reason you lose your sense of taste, I have lost my sense of smell, by the way, so I know how that feels. If you lose your sense of taste, it's a very sad thing. And if you lose your teeth, then you cannot chew. But then I have my sense of taste and smell and I have my teeth. And I really enjoyed the cookie. So that's my point. It's like you just got to find something really small mm. and you got to remember that all these seemingly mundane things, not everyone has. You know, sometimes when I rush for things and I'm so angry driving, I tell myself, how lucky you are to have a car in Singapore especially. Like how few people have, a, like, you know, not everyone has a car. Mm. So it's just a good reminder, I think. So like, so writing it down sometimes like, just makes you focus on that. Yeah, so I mean, these three good things is a positive psychology intervention whereby if we do this three, by writing down these three phrases or uh, commitments that we look out for, we train our mind to pay attention to, to notice what's good. Yeah. And we also put ourselves in a position to build the skills of savouring. Yeah. And sometimes we talk about savouring, we can savour like food experiences or like small little things and make us connect back to ourselves. And that is a small little mindfulness activity that will help us to stretch our ability to focus on positive things. Yeah. Yeah. And on that note, if you do it for more than seven to ten days immediately, you could see an uptick in our positive emotions and also our well-being. Mm. Yeah. See, uh, everyone should do it. <laughs> everyone should do it, everyone yes. Everyone really should do it. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Jade. And I'd like to thank you for being on the show, being so brave and being so vulnerable <laughs> with getting naked with happiness. Truly, uh, I feel like <laughs> I've gotten naked. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you who are watching this and listening in, Getting Naked with Happiness is about having this conversation so that we can share our emotions openly, so that by doing so, we create a space of uh, safety and trust. And we hope that you have learned something from th today's talk or show. And for those of you who are watching this or listening to this, if you have any feedback, comments or any thoughts, please contact us at Getting Naked with Happiness and let me know if you have any ideas also. And thank you for watching the show.